This video is about the Imperial Laurel. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the use of laurels in Warhammer art and on models. And I'll talk at length about kind of the values associated with the laurel and its historical context. So a laurel is essentially a crown created from green branches and leaves of a shrub or tree. And without context, the symbol is fairly meaningless and perhaps even a little absurd. Why would anyone place such a decoration on their head? What is the significance of a laurel? And where does it originate? At its core, the laurel is a religious symbol that became associated with achievement, a state of excellence, military honor, and indeed the identity of Julius Caesar and the emperor. Uh, you'll notice laurels on many different Warhammer models and depictions throughout Warhammer art. Uh, perhaps the most notable example can be found on artwork that depicts the Emperor of Mankind, and there are many such examples. And they all portray this kind of golden laurel around his head. Uh, another prominent example would be the depiction of the newly arisen risen Primarch robot Gilliman. In fact, you see laurels throughout the Ultramar Ultramarine product line adorning art, models, and especially banners and other related iconography. Perhaps the best examples of laurels can be found throughout the Imperial Fists and their successor chapters. All right, so the new Horse Heresy accessory kit for the Imperial Fists was recently promoted, and uh, there you can see some great examples of laurels being used on Space Marine helmets. You also see some prominent examples on Pedro Cantor of the Crimson Fists, and some striking examples, especially on the Black, Temper, Black Templar's Emperor's Champion models, and uh, there are many different iterations over the years. So what does the laurel represent to those within the Imperium? According to the Codex Astartes, the Imperial Laurel is a Space Marine honor badge that appears as a wreath of interlocking leaves usually fashioned of platinum or gold, worn as a crown above the helmet, or sculpted into a Battle Brothers helmet. It can also be displayed on the crest of a shoulder pad or knee pad, often with a skull and wreath motif. The imperial laurel signifies skill, loyalty, and heroism, and may only be rewarded to a space marine who has completed a great act of valor and performed some great deed that leads to a victory for the Imperium. A space marine who wears the laurel is, to his peers, a proven warrior of his chapter. The word of a battle brother who wears the imperial laurel will carry more weight than it would otherwise, sometimes influencing the nature of his missions or gaining the use of rare assets, weapons, or allies, and the right to carry the company standard into battle. The laurel is a distinguishing feature and a traditional battle honor but it's not universally used across the various chapters of Astartes. For example, you're not going to find the Imperial Laurel motif on too many Space Wolves, even though they certainly have the skill and valor to be awarded such an honor. It simply isn't within their range of aesthetics. But why a Laurel in the first place? And why is it not universally applicable to all Space Marines, even though it really should be? And that's because the Laurel also denotes specific values. It's, you know, it's not a definitive list, but a, a laurel has become associated with things like purity, order, stoicism, righteousness, nobility, achievement, and excellence. And unsurprisingly, these are the values that one would associate with the emperor, right, with ultramarines, and kind of the close imperial followers like the imperial fists. These are chapters that are loyal, their aesthetic is pure, purely militant, and they exhibit a really straightforward, simple ethos. But where do these actual values come from? Why is there such a thing as an imperial laurel in the first place? The origin of this emblem resides in the cultural legacy of ancient Terra, in the history of ancient Greece and Rome. Now, most listeners would probably be 
familiar with the ancient Olympic Games, but there were certainly actually four different Panhellenic Games that rotated in sequence. The Olympic Games held at Olympia, the Pythian Games held at Delphi, the Nemean Games held at Nemea, which is a basically a small village north of Argos, and the Isthmian Games naturally held at the Isthmus of Corinth. These were games of competition, with each featuring a different sporting event, you know, things like boxing, racing, wrestling, but also some games that uh, you know featured art, poetry, and dancing. These games were of immense cultural significance to the ancient Greeks, and naturally they also had a religious significance, and many of the games had a mythological origin. The Olympic Games were dedicated to Zeus, the Pythian Games were held in honor of Apollo, obviously at Delphi, the Nemean Games were connected to the labor of Hercules, and you know the Greek world really was divided into hundreds of small city-states that were kind of frequently at war with one another. But when the games were held, a truce was announced so that athletes and re religious pilgrims could travel from their cities to games, to the games in safety. This is the basically the sublimination of the goddess Eros, representing strife and discord into something a little more productive. What did the Greeks compete for at these games? What was the ultimate prize? There were no monetary awards or prizes, no medals, and that's because the highest prize was a simple laurel. The games at Olympia awarded a crown of olive leaves cut from the sacred tree. The Pythian games awarded a wreath of bay laurel that was sacred to Apollo. The Nemean games awarded a wreath of wild celery leaves, and the Isthmian games a wreath of pine. Here, too, the religious component is quite obvious, as gods like Zeus and Apollo were often depicted wearing the laurels that they are basically associated with. So there's a basic sense here already that being awarded a laurel is almost the equivalent of being, um, makes that recipient above other men. It almost creates a level where they're, they're somewhat godlike. And the physical prize here is quite insignificant. But the perceived value of the prize is without equal. What counted most of all was the fame and supreme glory of becoming an Olympic victor. Winning against all the Greeks in competition meant that the winner embodied arete, that fine Greek concept of excellence. And one could say that arete is essentially the platonic form of an athlete in that specific competition the best runner, the best horse racer. The winners were admired and celebrated throughout Greece, and the Greeks tracked the passage of time in so-called Olympiads based upon the games and winners. So there's a real sense of immortality as achievements would be recognized forever. You should be somewhat skeptical of Herodotus, and especially his depiction of Persians, but he, he records the foreign amazement of these competitions and the awarded laurels in his histories. Here we have an act, uh, interaction between members of Xerxes' entourage and a group of Arcadians shortly after the 300 Spartans had sacrificed themselves at Thermopylae. In the dialogue, a Persian wants to know what the Greeks are, are doing, seeing as their forces had basically withdrawn. Uh, they were basically regrouping after the loss at Thermopylae, but they're also being faithful to the truce imposed by the games, even in the face of an existential threat. And the Arcadians told the Persians that the Hellens, i.e. Greeks, were celebrating the Olympic festival and watching an athletic competition and an equestrian contest. When the Persian asked what prize they were competing for, the Arcadians told him that the winner would receive an olive wreath. Upon hearing that, another Persian exclaimed to Xerxes, Good grief, what kind of men do you lead us here to fight, who complete not for money, but for excellence alone? Arete, that, that pursuit and the demonstration of excellence is you know, understandably one of the highest values in Greek society. And this cultural context is the reason why this simple symbol of inter, intertwined leaves and branches donates 
you know, true achievement even within Warhammer uh, and its lore. But we need to also understand how this symbol became aligned with the identity of an emperor. To understand that, we turn to the Roman context. Now, the Romans were obviously heavily influenced by Greek culture, but they have their own contributions that ensures the humble laurel becomes associated with glory, power, and immortality. Whereas the Greeks received laurels for accomplishments in sports and arts, the pragmatic Romans received laurels largely through military deeds. They had an honor called the Corona Civica, or the Civic Crown. This was a crown or garland of oak leaves and acorns awarded if you met the following four conditions during combat. First, you had to save the life of a Roman citizen, basically meaning a fellow soldier in battle. Second, you must kill the opponent that threatened his life. Third, you must hold the ground on which the action took place. It doesn't help if you simply rescue your comrade and then retreat. And fourth, that person whose life you have saved must testify on behalf of the recipient. And so remember that the Imperial Laurel from 40k is awarded to Space Marines who have completed a great act of valor and performs some great deed that leads to a victory for the Imperium. This isn't, it's a little different, but it's along the same lines as the Civic Crown, as they similarly denote a great deed. Now the Civic Crown was the second highest award that could be given out uh, into the Roman military, and it had its perks also in Roman society. Pliny the Elder writes in its natural history that those that receive the wreath may wear it for life, Everyone must rise when he enters a public space wearing the crown, and the recipient had the right to sit among the senators, and he, along with his father and paternal grandfather, basically up to the paterfamilias, were exempt from all public duties. So here too we have a sense that honor should be worth more than anything else, insofar as the crown itself was deliberately without material value. Right? They, they, they were still using basically common twigs, common leaves that anyone could create, right? It's not being cast into gold. And so this is maybe where Warhammer falls a little different insofar as they often have platinum and gold. But plenty writes of the Roman uh, crown, how worthy of eternity is a national, national character that rewarded exploits distinguished only by honor and refused to place a price on the life of a citizen thereby proclaiming it as wrong even to save the life of a human being for the sake of reward. Basically, they don't want it to have value so that you're not incentivized to try to get that reward to cash it in or to claim a monetary reward. So how did the civic crown become associated with the identity of an emperor and indeed like the god emperor of mankind? To answer that question, we need to discuss Julius Caesar and his successor, and the legacy that they created. Now Caesar was awarded the civic crown for actions taken at the siege of Mytilene in 81 BC. At that time he was a young man uh, in his early 20s. This was actually his first military action, but we know from his later campaigns in Gaul and elsewhere that he was not afraid to fight from the front lines and to take risks alongside his men. Uh, still quite an achievement to probably do that in your first military action. As we discussed, Caesar had the right to wear the laurel at all times, and no doubt it must have been somewhat amusing to make everyone stand up whenever he entered a room wearing the laurel. But we are also told by the Roman biographer Suetonius that Caesar frequently wore the laurel to hide a receding hairline. Now, Suetonius is an invaluable but difficult source. Uh, for instance, the statues depicting Caesar that have survived from antiquity uh, I'm not aware of any that actually depict him wearing a laurel. I could be wrong about that, but that's that's my impression of the statues I've seen. Most such statues were commissioned posthumously, but some were actually thought to have been produced during his lifetime. However, Caesar was the first Roman to stamp his image onto currency, onto Roman coins, and there are seemingly many examples of Caesar wearing a laurel on contemporary coins. And since coins long, at last, long outlasted the Roman Empire, they have a surprising legacy. So following Caesar's assassination, 
his heir and political successor, Augustus, takes up the mantle. As mentioned earlier, the god Apollo is often depicted as wearing a laurel. Augustus claimed Apollo as kind of a patron deity, and so we do have examples of him wearing a laurel. Augustus had capable and loyal lieutenants, but he himself was not a particularly great military man, so the connection here is uh, more symbolic and religious. This is part of the process of apotheosis, whereby the emperor became worshipped and then later deified. So we can say that Caesar shattered the foundations of the Roman Republic, and Augustus oversaw the, the slow transition to empire. These two individuals really dominated the political space for almost a century, and during that time, they are frequently depicted with a laurel. Augustus, in particular, is the measure by which every subsequent emperor compared himself, right? Every subsequent Roman emperor takes the name Caesar and takes the name Augustus, a lot of other honorific titles, and copied their public, public imagery such that Emperors like later Claudius and Trajan are also depicted as wearing laurels. But I would not say that the depiction of laurels among emperors is especially common. There are examples of Trajan wearing a laurel, but many more without. The laurel only became established as an iconic symbol during the Renaissance in the 15th and 16th centuries. As I mentioned, the coins survived while many of the statues were forgotten, buried, or destroyed. There would have been many newly discovered and newly printed Roman writings, like those of Suetonius, that portray Caesar as always wearing a laurel. Basically, the humanists really become fascinated with the life and deeds of Julius Caesar, and his portrait, as depicted wearing the laurel on coins, is spread far and wide. It's a simplification, but this is how Caesar equals laurel, and laurel equals emperor, really becomes codified in Western culture. Those associations really kind of cement themselves with the spreading of this image uh, throughout Europe. Such that by the 17th century, statues like Cousteau's Caesar were commissioned. And you, know, you can point to innumerable examples here, but I like to look at statues or images of Napoleon, who himself was a great admirer of Caesar, really styles himself as Caesar reborn, as a, a consul of France, and, and obviously the emperor of France, and he also uses a laurel. Uh, this imagery continued in uh, the literature and film of the 19th and 20th and 21st century. Uh, they certainly have life within Warhammer, where the laurel is preserved alongside the emperor and his most devoted and st stalwart sons. But it's more than a simple image. The ancient values associated with the laurel continue to have some life. Those two really become associated with kind of the character of the person. The ancient religious significance of the divine still resonates, and the laurel still signifies things like excellence, accomplishment, and nobility. I welcome any questions or comments you might have.